48メガの大容量が可能にした数々の新システムを搭載。その全貌を表す今ナムコが送る本格 RPG スーパーファミコンナムコテイルズオブファンタジア In a few of our previous videos, we briefly talked about some of the similarities between JRPGs and anime. I mean, come on, they're both from Japan. Oftentimes, the in-game graphics and or character arts are heavily anime inspired. And not always, but usually, it's a pretty safe bet to assume the story will feature something about a young main hero going on a journey of sorts, joining up with various friends along the way, as they eventually work their way towards defeating the evil villain and restoring peace to the land. With that said, not all JRPGs borrow as much inspiration from anime as some others do. For example, While the character designs in Lost Odyssey were designed by a famous Japanese manga artist, the actual in game models are a bit more realistic and not too anime influenced. Whereas games like Persona 5, on the other hand, go all out with the anime setting and turn the influence up to max. As much as the Persona series screams anime, though, the school like settings of the games make them a little bit different than the types of anime I grew up watching. I was all about shonen anime. You know, the type of stuff you'd see in Shonen Jump, Dragon Ball, Yu Yu Hakusho, Rurouni Kenshin, and stuff like that. These usually took place in more fantasy worlds and were a little less grounded in reality. To me, the JRPG series that best represents the Shonen anime feel and vibe has gotta be, hands down, the Tales series. Whenever I play some of these games, I'm just taken back to being a 12 year old kid again, sitting on my couch, watching Toonami after school. There's just so much I love about them the vibrant fantasy worlds, the huge focus on character development and their relationships with one another, the often present theme of overcoming adversity to achieve your desired outcome, the sense of adventure that immerses you into the hero's journey, and so on and so forth. These beats all just feel so familiar and cozy to me. I know a lot of people like to refer to Dragon Quest as JRPG comfort food, and while I completely agree with that statement, if you don't factor in the less traditional battle system, I feel like the Tales series falls in that camp as well. For the most part, outside of different themes and slight gameplay design choices between some of the titles, you pretty much know what you're in for and the type of experience you're about to get, at least for a lot of the older games. Some of the newer entries have started to branch out a bit. Speaking of newer entries, though, that's exactly why I wanted to make this video. By the time this video comes out, the newest entry in the Tales series, Tales of Arise, will be releasing within the next one to two days. With that in mind, I thought this would be a perfect time to take a brief look back at all the older, mainline games in the series. And yes, I specifically said mainline, as if I were to cover all the spinoffs as well. That would make this video way too long. I feel like a lot of people are more interested about the mainline games anyway, so yeah. Anyway, this newest entry will likely bring a lot of new people to the series that might be curious to learn more about the previous games. This one's for you guys, and of course to the existing fans who just want to take a nostalgic trip down this iconic JRPG series lane. Enough chit chat though, let's just dive into the meat of this video. Starting with Tales of Fantasia. Tales of Fantasia was initially released back in 1995 for the Super Famicom. It was developed by the Wolf Team, otherwise known today as the Namco Tales Studio. The original Super Famicom version was never released outside of Japan, so we wouldn't see this game in English until the 2006 Game Boy Advance port. There were also PS1 and PSP port slash remakes as well, but like the Super Famicom version, the West didn't get those either. Being the first title in the series, Tales of Fantasia obviously set a lot of staples going forward. Now, familiar terms such as apple gels and orange gels for recovery items, the whole dual world concept, and stuff like that. What really made this game stand out compared to other JRPGs at the time, though, was its unique 2D action based battle system. 
While the exploration style with the overworld map and visiting towns and dungeons was very similar to other JRPGs, the gameplay on the other hand was definitely not. There were no turn-based battles here, just pure action. Battles did still take place on a different screen, however, making the game feel a lot different compared to other RPGs with action-based battle systems, like Secret of Mana for example. The developers called this the Linear Motion Battle System. It should not be understated just how unique this was for the time. It was actually the first RPG to ever have a battle system like this to my knowledge. Now with that being said, being the first of its kind, of course it doesn't come without some flaws and is a bit rough around the edges these days. While the gameplay would obviously be improved upon in later entries and doesn't necessarily hold up the best in current times, everything else about the game absolutely does. Sound-wise, series composer Motoi Sakuraba absolutely kills it here, and visually, the game is just stunning for a Super Famicom game. Easily one of the best-looking games on the entire system, JRPG or not. It's also the only Super Famicom game to hold the title of containing a fully vocalized original song within the game. Plus, there were voices in battle as well. All these feats made Tales of Fantasia an absolute technical marvel at the time and was surely a sign of more good things to come. The second game in the series would be Tales of Destiny and it would come out for the PlayStation in Japan in 1997 and 1998 in North America. This one was also developed by the Wolf Team as well. While Tales of Fantasia received great reception and was praised for pushing the genre forward both in terms of technical aspects and the gameplay, the reception to Tales of Destiny was a little more lukewarm. For being released on the PlayStation, it still very much looked and felt like a Super Nintendo game. In its defense, this would be a criticism of a lot of earlier PlayStation RPGs though, as it wouldn't be until Final Fantasy VII came along and really set things apart. I don't mean to paint Tales of Destiny as a bad game either. It's still a solid game that features great character design, a cool enough story, and awesome music. It's just, when being compared to other JRPGs at the time, this is probably one of the only Tales of titles that didn't stack up quite as favorably. Fortunately, Tales of Eternia would come out a few years later and improve upon a lot of these aspects. This one was also developed by the Wolf Team and came out for the PlayStation in 2000 in Japan and 2001 in North America. There was later a PSP port as well that was released everywhere in the world besides North America. Go figure. It was actually localized as Tales of Destiny 2 in its English release, probably to help people know that it was in the same series as Tales of Destiny 1, but considering there was a Tales of Destiny 2 that came out in Japan not too much later, I'm not going to call it that to avoid confusion. Tales of Eternia is the canonical name after all. This one was actually my introduction to the series, and while it didn't hook me in as much as some of the later entries, I still remember having a good time with it. Graphically, I think this game holds up great, but it did still receive some criticism at the time as a lot of other JRPGs were doing the whole 3D thing by then. It's no unpopular opinion to say that for the most part, visually, later 2D games sold up better than earlier 3D games, so this actually works in its favor now. Tales of Eternia received generally more favorable reception than its predecessor. It was just a more complete game overall. Gameplay was a bit smoother, and there was more stuff to do. In many people's eyes, it's the best 2D entry in the series. As good as the game was though, the Tales series was still really niche, even for JRPG standards. At least in terms of Western popularity, as the series was pretty popular in Japan. Unfortunately, this would remain the case for a while longer, as the next Tales game wouldn't even get an English release. Tales of Destiny 2 was released in Japan for the PlayStation 2 in 2002. Shit, that was a lot of twos. It was co-developed by both the Wolf Team and Selenet Japan, and would be the last title they would release under the Wolf Team moniker. As is probably obvious by the title, Tales of Destiny 2 is a direct sequel to the first Tales of Destiny game. To this day, there's still yet to be an English fan translation of this one, so it continues to remain a mystery to a lot of us Western fans. For being a PS2 game, this one still has a pretty similar graphical style and battle system compared to the previous games, and doesn't look like it really did much to propel the series forward. I'm sure it was a solid title, just nothing groundbreaking compared to what we had seen before. However, in 2003 in Japan and 2004 in North America, the Tales series would forever change as we know it and usher in a whole new wave of fans with the GameCube title, Tales of Symphonia. 
By this point, the Wolf team was renamed as the Namco Tail Studio, and man, did they absolutely kill it here. Tales of Symphonia was extremely popular in the West, both in terms of critic reception and overall sales. It was easily the best-selling Tales game they had ever had overseas. It had the perfect recipe, really. Not only was it an excellent game on its own merit, but after the Nintendo 64, it was the first, more traditional type JRPG to be released on a Nintendo console in a long time. Needless to say, Nintendo fans were pretty starved for JRPGs. This was the series' first foray into 3D, and it added a level of immersion never seen before. Battles weren't technically in true 3D yet, as they used what the developers called a multi-line linear motion battle system that kind of gave you the illusion of 3D, but you still really only moved in certain preset lines. There was just multiple of them, as opposed to one. But still, it allowed for vastly different combat overall, and was a much more satisfying experience. What also helped this game stand out is that for us English fans, it was the first time they had localized and included skits which are a major part of the story. Surprisingly, these were actually cut out in the English versions of both Tales of Destiny and Tales of Eternia, which really sucks because they add so much to the character dynamics and flesh them out a lot. Like, these really drew me in in Symphonia and helped develop the characters a lot better than the more one-note personality they show during most story scenes. By cutting these out, you cut out an essential part of the Tales experience, so for them not to be in Destiny or Eternia was a damn shame. While they still weren't voiced yet like they were in the Japanese version, I'm just happy we finally got them as I'm sure they helped draw in a lot of Western fans to the series as well. I had never seen anything like this in a JRPG before, which just helped me appreciate it even more. This may not have been the first Tales game I ever played, but it was the one that made me fall in love with the series. We're actually working on a retrospective to this timeless classic right now, so expect a video out on that in the next couple weeks. The next game in the series was Tales of Rebirth for the PlayStation 2. This one was developed by the Namco Tales Studio and was released in 2004. There was also a PSP port released in 2008, but unfortunately, the West hasn't gotten either of these versions, or even a fan translation at that. So yeah, to us non-native Japanese speakers, we still don't know a lot about this one yet. It looks like a unique blend of 2D and 3D though, with this variation of the gameplay being called the Three Line Linear Motion Battle System. Battles are in 2D and take place on three lines as the name suggests. From what I've gathered online, the story in this one seems to deal with some pretty heavier themes about different species coexisting and the racism within that. Given this one was never released in English though, there's only so much I can say about it. With that said, it does look really cool, so maybe one of these days they can finally bring it over. We did actually just feature this game in our recent video about 8 great JRPGs that were never released outside of Japan, so if you're curious to hear a little more about it, then check that video out. Luckily for us Western fans, the next entry in the Tales series would make it stateside again. Tales of Legendia would come out for the PlayStation 2 in 2005 in Japan and 2006 in North America. Unlike all the previous games in the series prior to this one, a different development team by the name of Project Melphis actually took full control here. The main team was working on Tales of the Abyss at that time, so they formed this small collective group with members from the Namco Tale Studio along with their Tekken and Soul Calibur departments. Being that it was developed by a different team, this one has a quite a different feel and overall tone compared to previous Tales games, and to some people, is considered the black sheep of the series. Personally, when I first played this as a kid, I was expecting something more along the lines of Tales of Symphonia, so I was a little disappointed to be honest. Now that I'm older though, I've come to appreciate it in ways that I didn't back then. The battle system is in 2D, but it's much more fun than the previous Tales 2D battle systems. The members from the Tekken and Soul Calibur departments may have had something to do with that. Music-wise, the soundtrack here is absolutely incredible. Motoi Sakuraba did not compose this one, as it was composed by Go Shina instead, and he really outdid himself. To many fans, it's considered one of the best soundtracks in the entire series, if not the best. While this may not be a popular opinion, I still do know a lot of people that consider Tales of Legendia to be one of their favorites in the series. While I do think it's a good game, it's not one of my personal favorites, but I do respect others' taste, as there's a lot to love here. 
The next entry, Tales of the Abyss, would be released for the PlayStation 2 in 2005 in Japan and 2006 in North America. It would later be ported to the 3DS as well. This was the game the main Namco Tales studio was working on, while the other one was focusing on Tales of Legendia. While some of the previous games had 3D style graphics, this was the first one in the series to actually feature full 3D battles with the introduction of the free run mechanic. By holding L2, you had full control to move in complete 3D, being able to circle enemies or whatever else. This was absolutely groundbreaking for the series and became a staple going forward. When it comes to the plot, in my opinion, the story in Tales of the Abyss is easily one of the stronger ones in the entire series. And character development wise, I think it hands down does have the best example with its main character, Luke von Fabre. He may be annoying as hell at first, but man, is that payoff worth it? His whole arc and journey is just handled so well. We actually just covered this game in a full retrospective not too long ago, so if you want to hear some more of my detailed thoughts on this one, be sure to check that video out. Tales of Innocence would be the next Tales game to come out, but like some of the previous entries, this one never made it to the West either. In Japan though, it was released in 2007 for the Nintendo DS and would later get a remake for the PS Vita. This was the second game in the series not to be developed by the Namco Tales Studio and instead was developed by Alpha System. It was also the first mainline game to have its initial release come out for a handheld. While we never got an official English release, an English fan translation does exist, so this one is actually playable. Battles took place in 3D and were quite similar to Tales of the Abyss. Compared to the other mainline games though, I would say this is one of the weaker entries in the series, honestly. It's still a pretty solid title, it's just that with the quality of some of the other games, it just doesn't stack up quite as well. So, after one of the weaker entries in the series, what would come next? Well, naturally, one of the strongest titles to date, of course. Tales of Vesperia was released for the Xbox 360 in both Japan and America in 2008. This one was developed by the Namco Tales Studio, and it is an excellent title. I hate to use the term objective because stuff like the story and characters are always a matter of opinion, but as a complete overall game, it really is just one of the best in the series. There's just so much content here and the gameplay is so polished. Easily the most polished in the series up until this point. Honestly, even though this game came out all the way back in 2008, I still think it's the best looking title in the entire series. No joke. That cel shaded style and all the vibrant colors are absolutely timeless and still look fantastic to this day. I really don't know why they didn't continue to use this style. It's so gorgeous. Yuri is also an amazing protagonist, and his rebellious nature was a breath of fresh air for the series. Overall, this is one of my personal favorite Tales games for sure. It was only made better with the release of the Definitive Edition in 2019 for the Nintendo Switch. There's an extra playable character, and just way more content in general. Really, the only thing I can fault Vesperia for is that the story isn't really the best and does start to lose some focus as the game goes on. The next game in the series would be Tales of Hearts. This one was developed by the Namco Tales Studio and was initially released in Japan only for the Nintendo DS in 2008. Surprisingly though, there would be an English remake for the PS Vita several years later. Due to it coming out on a handheld and during a time when JRPGs weren't incredibly popular, this one kinda got overlooked, even amongst Tales of fans. A lot of people may not even know it's considered a mothership title actually, or have even played it. Being that the Vita still remains the only way to play it to this day, with a pretty high cost of entry unfortunately, that probably plays a pretty big factor I'm assuming. If this one were to ever get a Switch port, I can almost guarantee the Western Tales fans would eat it up and start giving it more of the praise and attention that it deserves. For new and old fans alike, it's worth checking out. Tales of Graces was the next Tales of game to grace us with its presence. It was developed by the Namco Tales Studio and was released for the Wii in 2009. That version never made it to the States, however. The West wouldn't see this one until the PS3 port in 2012. This one did have extra content with additional story sequences, so I'd say the wait was worth it. Graces is a pretty unique entry in the series in the sense that you start the game playing as kids and then eventually play as their adult versions after a time skip. Or teenage versions, whatever. 
The plot leans a little too much into the whole power of friendship trope in my opinion, but I do have to give the game credit for the scope of its story. The gameplay is also top notch as well, and features one of the most fun battle systems in the entire series. This was the first mainline console Tales game not to feature an overworld map, so that's pretty sad though. With the Tales of Vesperia styled map, I think this one could have been even better. I know that's just a personal preference though, as I am a sucker for overworld maps. Overall, this is still a solid entry in the series. The next entry in the series would be Tales of Zillia for the PlayStation 3. This one was developed by the Namco Tales Studio and was released in 2011 for Japan and a whole two years later in 2013 in North America. This was another unique title as it allowed us the option to choose between two main characters at the beginning of the game including both male and female representation. The story doesn't necessarily change, but you do get some interesting insights and perspective on the game's events based on who you choose. In general, the characters here are some of my favorites in the series, like Alvin, Gaius, and even Rowan. We need more badass grandpas in JRPGs. Battles are also loads of fun, and in my opinion, this one has the best skill system in the entire series. It's pretty similar to the Sphere Grid from Final Fantasy X, and it's just so satisfying to fill out and progress in. The exploration style isn't really my preference though, and sometimes the game does feel a little rushed, but overall, this is still a really solid title and one of my favorites in the series. I guess I wasn't the only one who felt that way, as this one was popular enough to get a direct sequel in Tales of Zillia 2. It was released for the PlayStation 3 in Japan in 2012 and 2014 in North America. By this point, the Namco Tales Studio had merged with their publisher, Namco Bandai Games, and would release all future Tales games under this name. Tales of Zillia 2 is pretty interesting in the sense that it's still considered a mothership title despite being a sequel to the one before it. Tales of Destiny 1 and 2 sort of did this, although despite taking place in the same world, for the most part, the characters were all different and it had its own standalone plot. And Tales of Symphonia, Dawn of the New World, is considered a spin-off actually and not a mothership title, so we don't talk about that one. Tales of Zillia 2, on the other hand, takes place one year after the events of the first game and features all of those same characters. So yeah, you pretty much have to play the first game in order to play this one if you want to be able to fully appreciate the story that is. And story-wise, this one does get pretty dark darker than most Tales games for sure. The combat in this is also improved upon the original, with various weapon playstyles for the main character. Speaking of the main character, for the first time in the series, we were given a silent protagonist. Given the nature of the game requiring you to make a lot of choices, it does kind of make sense I guess, but I don't know. I'm just not a fan of a silent protagonist in a series that's supposed to be known for its character interaction. It's probably not a coincidence that they decided not to revisit this idea after this one. It just doesn't work that well with the types of games these are. This, plus the whole depth system, really kind of drags the game down for me, but it's still a pretty fun title overall. The next game, Tales of Zestaria, would be released worldwide for the PS3 and the PS4 in 2015. This game was a unique entry, as it's the only one to be co-composed by both Motoi Sakuraba and Go Shina. This was the 20th anniversary to the series, so I guess they felt it was necessary to bring on both. Hey, no complaints here. What there were complaints about though, was sort of the advertising around this game. A lot of the promotional material was heavily pushing a certain female character that ended up not even being playable for most of the game. This kind of rubbed some people the wrong way and did cause a little controversy back then. The DLC they later released about said character didn't really help either. Some fans just saw that as a cash grab after building interest for her character. In hindsight, this obviously doesn't affect the game at all, it's just kind of interesting to look back on. As far as the actual game, it's... not bad. It has a lot of great ideas for sure, but kind of falls short on some execution. Some stuff is just way too convoluted, like the equipment system for example. The battle system is fun though, and I'm a big fan of the overall aesthetic along with the lore in this game, so it definitely has its pros and cons. It's not one of my personal favorites in the series, but there are some notable aspects to it, so I could see how some others would really enjoy this one. Alright, so the most recent and latest Mothership title we have is Tales of Berseria. 
This one was released in Japan for the PS3 and PS4 in 2016 and 2017 in North America. Kind of like Tales of Symphonia, Berseria helped bring in a lot of new fans to the series. It got really good reception from both fans and critics alike, with its super polished gameplay and darker themes in the main story. This was also our first time getting a female protagonist, so that was pretty cool. Tales of Zillia did give us the option of one with Mila, but in this one, you have no choice. You are Velvet in the story and on a quest for revenge. A lot of people consider this one to be one of the better entries in the series, and perhaps the best out of the newest generation of Tales games. While there are a handful of titles I do prefer over this one, it's still a great game overall. And with that, that is all 16 Mothership Tales titles to this date. And obviously, with Tales of Arise about to come out, that'll mark 17. How's it gonna hold up? Only time will tell. With that said, by the looks of it, I have some pretty high expectations and think it's gonna be an amazing entry in the series. At least so I'm hoping. I was kind of feeling that the series was in need of an overhaul while not abandoning what made it so loved in the process, and Arise looks to do just that. I'm really excited to dive into this one here soon enough. If you guys enjoyed this video, it would mean a lot if you could either hit that like button or even consider subscribing. If you want to see more Tales content, like retrospectives, the complete series ranking, a where to start video, whatever, just let us know in the comments below. We do have a retrospective over Tales of Symphonia coming out pretty soon, so look out for that one. As always, huge thank you to our Patreon supporters. Your generosity is very much appreciated. Other than that, thanks for watching everyone and hope you have an awesome day. This is Gaming Productions. Until next time.